also just um, bought a new program for presentations. I've never used it in public, so that's great. <laughs> um, okay, let's hope this works. see the presenter's view, so it'll be good. Um, so first of all, I want to say thank you all for being here. Um, I'm quite amazed that you all are here this morning, um, because when at 2 o'clock uh, Dr. Oblivion set up his science experiment somewhere on the fifth floor, uh, <laughs> and we all had to go down to the lobby, um, well, I, I I'm not sure I would be here if I wasn't standing up here right now. But um, my time is eight hours off, so the problem with being woken up at two o'clock is it's 10 in the morning. So the only thing you can really do is play on your presentation, which means I think I have about 89 slides. <laughs> um, and I'm gonna try to race through them as quickly as possible. So thanks for the introduction. Um, I do wanna give a quick shout out to the Shuttleworth Foundation. Um, they have a really amazing fellowship program and if you have a big idea, you want to build something and you need a little space and kind of social uh, startup capital, uh, they are definitely a good place to, to, um, to go. Okay, so it's special for me to be here and especially to be up here uh, today because P2P University um, has a long history with Open Ed um, and the history actually started before Open Ed. So when I was working in uh, Cape Town on open source software uh, reports for developing countries. Um, I was looking, I'd, I'd known about the open source world, obviously, I was looking for a, an equivalent for content. And I found this site called opencontent.org and they, there was this guy, David Wiley, he'd written a license that I could use. And uh, so I used his license before I ever got into open education. And so then a few years later I got interested, no, I'm, I'm gonna play this again, David, because you, uh, Thank you. That's um, beautiful. That is, that's amazing, eh? That is an, that is an animated GIF, by the way. Um, it, it took me hours to make that. Um, last night at 2.30, no, no. Um, so um, anyway, so then I got interested in open education, uh, mostly at the institutional side, so open courseware projects, and um, I uh, found out about the open education conference, and the first uh, open education conference I went to was in 2008. And we had this, a bunch of us had had this idea of, um, you know, there's all this content out there, what if we started some kind of a grassroots movement or little community that made sense of this content and worked through the courses together and kind of helped each other along. Um, and someone had the brilliant idea of calling it peer-to-peer -peer university, which resonated. And so in 2008, we actually submitted a session idea and said, uh, like, you know, come and build the peer-to-peer -peer university or something like this. Um, with, uh, you know, for good reasons, uh, I'm pretty sure it was the last session on the last day of the conference. Um, it was Friday afternoon, like quarter to four or something. People, half the people had left. We didn't expect anyone to come and the room was full. It was, we were amazed and it was, it, we were kind of on the hook also and that was the problem. You know, we didn't know if the idea had legs. All of a sudden there's a room full of people, academics mostly, who said this is a brilliant idea, you should really experiment with this and let's, you know, be, uh, see where this can go and, and, and one person uh, stood out, and that was Vijay Kumar, and he um, sat in the last row, actually, and we were talking about, should we use the same content structure, should we have departments, and you know, what, what does that look like? And we were kind of using the, the, the traditional university as a model. And he got increasingly agitated. I could see him kind of like shuffling on his seat, and then he, like, wa he was waving his hand, and eventually he, kind of, he, he just kind of jumped up, and he said, you know what, you're starting this from the wrong point. It's like, don't start from where the university is today, but imagine there was no university. Like, what would you come up with if there was no university? You didn't have all these ideas of what a university needs to be. And, and so that, was, that, that has stayed with me since then, VJ. so thank you very much for that. 2009, we came back, Vancouver, we had t-shirts, we had really bad haircuts. Um, <laughs> We were ready, uh, and we made an announcement at the conference that we were gonna launch the first seven courses, and we launched them on the 9th of September 2009, so 09, 09, 09, and um, well, it was incre incredibly exciting, it was nerve-wracking, we, we didn't know what was gonna happen, and, and it, was, it was great. And then 2010, we came back to Barcelona, and um, 
we were a very different beast. We actually organized a community workshop just before open education. These are all the people that came to the workshop, except the few people that had food poisoning, um, <laughs> which was a big problem actually at our conference. We only ever had about two thirds of the people there. Um, but, uh, and uh, yeah, you know, kind of using the open ed conference as a milestone has been really useful in this, in this trajectory. And so just a few words about P2P University, because I'm sure not everyone knows what we do. It's basically an open community for social learning. Anyone can join and contribute. You can start a course, you can act as a mentor, you can help with the development of the site, you can get involved in governance, you can help shape the strategy. Um, the original idea was to create a social layer, put people together around existing open educational resources, so not, a, not another content project. Um, and the learners are really in charge. They're, we're replacing kind of the top-down instruction model with a bottom-up peer-to-peer learning model. And um, we've always been interested in figuring out good ways to give recognition for what people do, and I think we've hit on, on something interesting with badges, and I'll talk about that later. So, you know, it's a fairly standard, very lightweight interface. We don't want to have all the tools and bells and whistles. We want people to go out and use tools in other places. Um, we, we are not going to build the monolithic, amazing learning management place that has everything and does everything. We, we just want to be kind of the lightweight connector of stuff. Um, in terms of size, we have about 23,000 user accounts. Uh, participation is global, which is great. So we have a lot of people coming from Latin America, although we have almost no courses in Spanish. Um, about 5,000 active users per month, uh, 60 to 80 new courses created per month, and unique visitors go up by about 25% each month. So we're small, but we're kind of large enough that you can start experimenting. It's interesting to look at kind of courses differences and how the people react to it, and what are models that work. And, um, we have a few focus areas. Uh, School of Webcraft is our partnership with Mozilla, which is really kind of focusing on web developer training um, and also was kind of the starting point for a lot of our thinking around badges. Uh, we've got a few other schools, um, School of Social Innovation, School of the Mathematical Future, and then a School of Ed, which is really just a pilot for professional development for teachers. And if anyone here is working in that space, uh, I'd love to talk to you because we uh, have lots of questions, basically. Um, we also try to partner with everyone who's in this community, and we are big fans of sailor.org. I don't know where they are, but I saw them in the lobby at two. Um, good to see you again. Uh, they are uh, running some of their great courses uh, on the P2P platform, and we've done something with Anya Kamenetz, uh, kind of trying to figure out if, like, is there a space for a self-learner module there where you actually don't want to offer a course or you don't want to join a course, you, you want to learn something, and you know, how do you get started? Um, and then, um, this is kind of cooking at the moment, the School of Open with Creative Commons. Uh, we haven't announced it in any big way, and I think we're not going to for a while because we really want to reach out to all the organizations and make this something that's inclusive, that has everyone who's part of this open movement you know, play a role in it. We don't want to, it's not the P2PU School of Open, it's not the Creative Commons School of Open, it's the School of Open. Um, but we're, we're cooking this up with cable at the moment, and so many of you will, will hear from us um, about this idea. But that's, um, I didn't want to talk just about P2PU. I, I actually wanted to get through these slides as quickly as possible, I think, as you can tell. Um, I wanted to think a little bit, you know, when you, um, like I'm someone who's very comfortable in the trenches. I, I like small rooms, I like, you know, sitting in a circle and really digging into something and then working on stuff together and like making progress and hacking and tinkering. And so when, when you get asked to stand up here, it's kind of a, it's a good opportunity to get out of your comfort zone and think a little bit more about like where are you, where are you, you know, when you're down there, like what does it look like from, from up here a little bit. Um, and, um, and so I've thought a little bit about open education in the last few days and I've also been a little frustrated with open education in the last few days, I, I admit, and I, I kind of couldn't really put my finger on it. And last night at two o'clock was just the perfect time to really drill, <laughs> like face the, face the, the questions that I had. Um, uh, and I think I, the, the frustration that I felt came from two sides. I felt on one hand, we are asking too much of open education. We have these huge expectations, and, and maybe not all of them are kind of the correct expectations. And at the same time, I feel like we're expecting too little of what open education could do. We're not daring enough, we're not bold enough, we're not kind of going in the direction that you know, this movement started, the spirit that this movement started with. And I just want to kind of give a few examples of that and then switch from the kind of that tension space into you know, imagining maybe a possible direction for open education going forward. So 
why do I think we are asking too much? I've, I've heard over and over, and I'm glad Cable actually didn't do that, but you know, so everyone kind of brushes aside the fact that OER is now making major uh, inroads into reducing the cost of textbooks. That's a huge deal. And so when I hear people say, well, you know, cost is great, but you really need to think beyond cost, and cost is only the beginning, they're absolutely right, but I think it's also worth stopping and saying, well, you know, as a matter of fact, especially in the US, cost is one of your major problems, and if we're able to help with that, then that's an amazing thing that we're doing. And so I feel like it's a little bit unfair sometimes to go, yeah, you know, you, like the textbooks are free, but you know, is that really having an impact? Well, you know, I think it is having an impact, and I think it's, it's worth kind of giving recognition to that work. Um, then I feel like there's this expectation that open is kind of drag, gets dragged in these days to fix everything. It's like, uh, you know, my basketball team is not winning. Open education is failing. We don't have <laughs> enough Nobel Prize winners, right? What's wrong with these open people? They promised they were gonna do that. And it's like, obviously open can't fix all the problems. And, and you know, especially when, you know, you, you're operating in a, in, a, in a structure and in a system that's very old and has grown in, in certain ways. And do, so the, the one example that I kind of, yesterday I kept going through my mind is like, you know, are we failing Brianna? And I, I don't, I'm, I hope I'm not misspelling her name, but, um, and I don't think we are failing Brianna because in most developed countries in this world, Brianna would have access to a very low cost student loan or a free tuition and she wouldn't have to work two jobs and drive an hour to her campus, which is why she dropped out, right? She looked like a perfect student that you would want in your higher education system. And if the structure doesn't have space for people like this, then that's a big problem. And open education should try to do something about it, but I don't think you can really blame open education or put the responsibility on open education for that. And then finally, I feel like we are maybe asking too much because we're looking at the institutions. We're, we're asking the institutions to drive the innovation. And we know that institutions are, for structural reasons, having a very difficult time to kind of imagine a future that's different from where they come from. Right? They're listening to their customers, they're listening to the government, they're listening to the industry, they're listening to the students, and they're all telling them things that kind of drive them in, in a certain direction. But if you want to see really dramatic change, like pattern shifting, then you need to step outside of that. And I think that innovation has to come from the fringes. And so the institutions, the recommendations that Clayton Christensen is making is, you know, new organizations, but also for existing institutions, set up kind of safe spaces. So don't make the innovation, don't make your open education innovation center part of the university that operates in the same structures and the same political climate, but make them independent. Maybe give them an office outside of the campus. You know, give them a lot of autonomy, give them senior buy-in, and then you will see really amazing innovation happening in the institution. Not that it isn't happening. I mean, the, the, I'm kind of speaking about the people who are not here. but. Um, and then why do I feel like we're not asking enough of open education? Because open education is global and some amazing stuff is happening outside of the US and outside of the developed countries and we're not really paying attention. In some sessions it kind of comes up, but just two examples. Like there's this whole talk about certification in open education. FGV is a private university in Brazil. They have an amazing open courseware program and they offer people to the op opportunity to kind of walk through their course and do some little kind of self-assessments as they go along, and at the end, they can print out a declaration of participation. It's free. They can, you have to work through the entire materials. You can print it out at the end. 1.3 million people have printed, or 1.3 million certificates have been printed. Now, if you compare um, the size of the Portuguese, these courses are in Portuguese, size of the Portuguese-speaking audience to this number, so I, I, I didn't do this, but if someone wants to do this, I'd love to hear the comparison. Like, how many people would print MIT certificates? Because, you know, how many, what's the size of the audience in English? How many people would print MIT certificates if 1.3 pe million people print these FGV certificates? And then there's, there's a project in China that's taken a lot of existing open materials and translated them and put them on a portal and they have an open education channel and they get 1.2 million unique visitors a day. I mean, it's mind-boggling. Like, these things are happening outside of our sphere. They're happening in other languages, and there's so much innovation that's, like, well beyond what we kind of sometimes get bogged down with day to day. So, maybe half a percent of the population. Wow, yeah. Well, there is Portugal, Angola, Mozambique, so there is more. But, uh, it, I mean, it's an, th this is the number that uh, he presented at the MIT Open Courseware Conference. I, I mean, I assume it's correct, but... Um, Maybe some pe people printed two or three. Um, then I think also open, uh, 
uh, needs to retain the spirit of a lab. I think that's where we started. Like, it was very experimental, and I don't think we should give up on it. I think it's important to mainstream it. It's important to have an impact on, on more people. But I think if we lose the lab focus, we lose the core of what Open started with. And kind of reiterating that in, in a slightly different way is, you know, a lot of the conversations here are drifting into the space of just education, you know, like making education work better or making education cheaper or more efficient. And they're not really open. Like the, the open character kind of gets lost a little bit sometimes. And I think open is about participation. It's about making things together. It's about tinkering and experimenting. It's essentially social. And there's a certain level of serendipity that I've always found amazing about these open spaces, that things happen you don't expect. And if you have these t perfectly curated experience where every learner gets you know, on-demand videos with little checks and badges and they get walked through this and they get to the end and it's really cheap and efficient, it's kind of like, it's great, but it doesn't sound like something I would want to do. Like, I want to be in a space where I work with other people, where things happen I didn't expect. And I want to kind of you know, interact with, with, with the ideas. And anyway. So I'll come back to this. So here's my kind of um, attempt at a big vision slide. Um, I, I heard this story about the Brothers Wright recently at a wedding. Um, and I don't know if it's true, it might be an urban myth. But apparently after they'd had their kind of successful uh, attempt to fly, they were asked about the experience and they said, well, if we had studied flight before we built this thing and, and, and jumped off the cliff, we would have never done it because what we would have learned is that it's impossible to do. And so all the people who were investigating flying and studying it and they're like, they were doing all the tests and they realized that it is impossible for humans to fly. And it took these guys who were, you know, who didn't do that, who didn't listen to the conventional wisdom and who didn't care about the constraints that like, you know, that they, they would have known that it's impossible, that they just went ahead and did it. And so I feel like we kind of have two choices. One is, and, and both of these are good choices, and I think both of them should happen and will happen. I think they are important. There's an important distinction in this open education space. One is I think we can focus on solving the major education problems of a system that is somewhat broken, it, it, you know, it, it's here and there. And open has a lot to bring to this, and I think open will make huge improvements to the system. Or, slash end, we can imagine what the impossible open education future could look like. So if we didn't listen to all the people about what we can't do, and we didn't know what the university looks like and what education looks like, well, what could we come up with? And so I wanna kind of run through some ideas here, and they're, they're much less grand than I set them up to be. Um, and the, the, you know, the, there are things that are happening now, but I think they point in directions that you know, we could go into and we could push further. And if you start kind of taking things apart and breaking them apart and like questioning them, you, you know, there's some interesting stuff that we could do with education that isn't happening right now. Um, okay, good. I'm almost on track, I think. I'm only about 25 slides behind. Um, so, uh, I'm not kidding. Um, so, <laughs> Okay, well, let's look at learning, right? So learning is obviously one of the key things that we are all interested in. Um, yesterday, we've already, I'm go sorry, Jim, if you're here, I'm gonna repeat two of your examples, but you know, we're seeing some pretty interesting stuff happening with the, how we conceptualize courses and, and learning. Like, there's the digital storytelling course that Jim talked about yesterday. There's the AI course at Stanford, and I looked up the final number. It's 145,000 people that subscribe to this. And so these people, kind of went ahead and did things that are impossible, right? You can't have a course with 145,000 people. And they just, well, we'll see how it goes. It's just started recently. But, you know, they're, they're going ahead and doing it. Um, now, at, at PWPU, we kind of took a slightly different approach because we started with a really, like, we felt what was important was to have a strong bond between the people who work through in a course together. And so size is kind of, you know, runs against that at some point. You, 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 you want to know the other people. You want to spend time with them. You want to get to know them. And I think that's a good experience. Not better in any way, but different good. And so that's kind of where we started. And we, what we realized is that when you have courses um, that are small, they end up depending a lot on the quality of the facilitator. And the facilitator is really difficult to scale. So we, had this, we were in this position where we had some web development courses 
and we got some you know, uh, fortunate press. But from Friday to Sunday, uh, from Friday to the next Monday, we had 8,500 people standing at our gates demanding more web development courses. And we realized, well, the current model, it would take us so long to find all these new facilitators and then kind of give them the tools that they can be great facilitators and they don't become instructors, but they become kind of guides that help peer learners. That we, you know, it would take very, very long to get to that, to that point where we could have 8,500 people just show up one day and, and we, could, we, could, um, we could offer them something. And so we kind of started thinking, well, what are the other alternatives? And one alternative I think is, that's interesting is, let's call it a learning expedition. And if you look at mountain climbing, then th I thought that was kind of a good example. Um, you know, you, you kind of know where you are, obviously. You're at, the, you're at the start there. And you kind of know where you want to go. It's somewhere up there. Um, and then lots of people have gone before you, and they've left these little markers. And it's actually quite amazing what they're called. Um, it's, it's all in German, but there's one called the Iron, which is for, like ironing board. There's one called the Death Bewerk, which is probably a very good place to stay overnight. Um, there's the, the Spider, uh, the Broken Band. Uh, anyway, yeah, I, th like these things almost sound cool. Like I want to go and I want to stay at the Death Bewerk one night. And so there's these markers that people have placed into the mountain and you can follow their path, right? Like they, they, there's kind of a community that's gone before you and if you follow the path, you join that community. But also there's nothing keeping you, keeping you from going left or right, right. There's no, no one says you can only go on this path. Now in mountain climbing, obviously, if you go off the path, you might never get to the top. But in learning, I think, if you go off the path, maybe you'll take a little longer to get to the place you want to go. Or maybe you'll, you'll end up in another place and it's equally interesting or more interesting for you. So, you know, the, the idea of that map came up yesterday and I think this is, this is the kind of map that, that I, I think makes sense in open education. And then if you get stuck in mountain climbing or you're a little nervous about the, the, the route, uh, you know, you can hire a climbing guide. You can hire someone who's gone this path before you, who, who can give you the advice, who, you know, occasionally they might carry your bag a little bit, but mostly they just point you in the right direc direction and they kind of go, you know, check this out. And if you want to go off the path, you know, they're, they've li likely they've done that before you and they can help you. And so how do we translate that into online learning? Um, so we've come up with a model that we call challenges. Uh, which is really learning expeditions, and it's a set of tasks that you work through kind of step by step, and then there's a set of challenges which you can think of as these positions on the, on the course up the mountain. Um, and we've rolled some of the stuff that we saw in the mountain climbing into this. So um, there's badges that we attach to these challenges, both as a way to give you recognition of where you've been. So you've, you've made it to the death BWAG, yes, here's the death BWAG badge but also as a sign of where you're gonna go next. So I can then show you the badge for the next thing. You can go, okay, well, you know, that's the direction I wanna go in. I, I know what that badge means. I'm gonna follow that path of the badge into this direction. And if you need a guide, right, then you can get a mentor. And one thing we found in the, in the kind of grassroots or volunteer-driven open education space, it's a huge ask to ask someone to run a course for six weeks, right? If I go to any of you and I say, hey, you know, I really like your work in this area, would you run a course for six weeks on PDPU? You're all gonna hesitate and you're gonna go, well, I'm a very busy person, how much time will it take? It's really easy to ask people if they, are, they would act as a mentor because they get a one-on-one -on -one relationship with someone who's learning. Uh, it's much less time consuming, it's demand driven, they don't have to prepare, like they set up a call and that person comes with problems and they listen to the problems and they share their experiences. So it's a much easier way to scale support if you offer mentorship instead of instruction. So I, this slide I think is accidentally here, it should be somewhere else, but it is an important point um, that in these challenges we've structured um, all of the learning as making things together with others. So the challenges are not designed for you. You can technically work through them on your own if you really don't like to work with other people but they all have prompts where you need to review other people's work, you need to uh, kind of prompt them to review yours, there's a social interaction, and, and many of the badges actually require peer assessment, so you need the opinion of your peers. So this is social is baked into this to avoid the, the problem that we would have all these people kind of just on their own path, you know, not looking left and right. Um, and so, you know, what makes a good challenge is one question that we've been asking, 
uh, for a while now, and we've come up with a 10 piece kind of framework um, that we are testing at the moment to see if it works in other domains except web development. Um, and also, I guess the, the, the most exciting thing about these challenges is really the first set we had to develop them because we didn't have any challenges. There was no model, we didn't have examples. So, you know, it was difficult for me to go to someone and say, hey, why don't you design a challenge? And they would say, well, what is a challenge? And I would say, I, I'm not sure. But now we've got a set of challenges and we have this kind of how-to that has 10 components. And the idea is that as people work through the challenges, as you get to the top of the mountain, you now get to design new challenges for other people. And I mean, how amazing would it be if you're learning something and you get to the end of the class and now you get to set the challenges for the next group. And if you do that online, you know, in web development, you could easily have a thousand people work through your challenge. I mean, what an incredible, both reputational benefit is that, but also, you know, what a great feedback for my own learning and what I've accomplished as a web developer, as a learner, if I can help other people learn and there's this response to the, the challenge I've given them. So I've tried to think a little bit about kind of like learning, like what, you know, what could learning look like if we, if we didn't know that some of these things were impossible. Now let's switch to assessment, which is obviously a huge topic at the moment and lots of people are interested in it. And in a way, learning assessment is a little bit like baseball scouting about 20 years ago. Um, and I don't know how, if you've read the book Moneyball or watched, I think the movie's out, uh, you, you kind of know where I'm going with this. But the, 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 the interesting thing there is that baseball teams are faced with a very difficult problem. They have to find people at a young age when they've only played baseball for a short time and they have to pick the ones that are going to be successful major league baseball players. And it's very difficult to do that. And so the community of baseball teams kind of developed these two strategies. The first one was to say it's basically an art. Right? Like you need experts who have done this for many years and they've developed a taste for, they can smell a good ball player and they developed a whole language around, like he throws like a, a horse or something. And he, like, I don't know what the language is, but if you don't speak the language, you, you can't participate. And that's in partly intentional, right? So it's like, we are the people who know how to choose the good ball players. So we're important. You need us. And we go around and we check out all these young guys and then we say, this, you know, pick this guy, he's a winner. And so there's, a, there's kind of this, this art of, of doing assessment. And then the, the next step was, well, then they started having some data and analytics. And, and as always, you know, people put a lot of faith into data. So you, you give me statistics, okay, well, it looks like you know, there's something meaningful there. But there isn't always. And so the, the first statistics that the baseball teams had were, were looking at were things like RBI, runs batted in, which means you're, if you're up to bat and there's like a guy already on the, on the plate, I mean, I know most of you are American, but uh, <laughs> for, the, for the few of us who are not. Um, and you hit the ball and the guy runs in, then you've batted one run in. And so they, they count that and seemingly that's a really important statistic because each run obviously is a score and you want more runs and you win the games. But actually it isn't. They found out later, they looked at the kind of more sophisticated statistic, they found that RBI is actually not a very uh, significant statistic that you should be looking at um, in terms of a player's impact on, on, winning, on, on a winning team. And so I feel a little bit like some of the um, stats and, and tools and measurements that we have today are in that category where we place a lot of faith into things like the SETs, right? I mean, they are important if you think about kind of milestones in people's lives. But what do they really say about someone's ability to be a good citizen later or be a good colleague or be kind of an interesting, you know, have interesting ideas or solve problems or, you know, very little. And we, we kind of proxy all this other stuff, but it's dangerous. So I think assessment, coming back to assessment, you know, ideally assessment, the easiest assessment, well, the, not the easiest, but the easiest to defend is if it's authentic. If someone does something and I can observe it and they're kind of, the, the, the activity is part of the assessment, it's very easy to say if someone is good or bad. So if, you, if you're a sculptor and here's the, scu you know, I'm doing the sculpting and here's the sculpture. Any other words with sculpt in the beginning? Um, right, then that's like, that's part of the learning and part of the work is the assessment. If I play a sport, I win, I beat you in chess, it's like, you know, I don't, you, I don't need to do a test. So every time you, you do a test that's separate from the activity, you have some inaccuracies, you, you have constraints that you introduce, you are not really assessing the core of what you're trying to assess anymore. 
Um, the, the, the other thing is quick feedback and good failure are important. And so Cable told me this amazing story yesterday about how he um, set out to learn to play computer games recently. And he's getting help from, a, from a, an expert, his uh, fi five-year-old or six-year-old? His six-year-old son, who's sitting next to him, coaching him, and Cable's kind of running down, jumping up rocks, and the son is rolling his eyes, and, but he's like, he's still there, he's like, keep going, Dad, keep going, you're gonna get there. Um, but the amazing thing about computer games is like this one here, right? It's boom, game over, and then there's this thing that says press R to try again. Well, ha what if education was like that? You know, like, okay, I'm learning calculus. Damn it, I didn't get any of it, all my answers are wrong, press R. You go back to the beginning, you try again. And, like, and there's no like stigma attached to that, right? It's, it's part of how you learn to be a game player, that you have to try over and over again. It's part of the fun of playing games, that you fail. And then failure leads to more motivation. It doesn't lead to discouragement. And I think good assessment does this. Good assessment gives you quick feedback that encourages you, that motivates you to work harder, that doesn't say you're dumb, you didn't make, you're not good enough, which is what a lot of our assessment today Says. So assessment it has to be learning, otherwise it's not uh, useful. And learning, here's, my, here's where it should be. Learning is, uh, if learning is making things with others, then what does it mean about how we can assess learning? Well, today we've got a few interesting possibilities that we didn't have some time ago. Right? One is we can let action speak. So when people do things online, they click on things, every little click creates a data point. And it's the analytics stuff, and I know there's a, every, it's the A word, and People don't like it, and let me just say this. I think we are at the first step of analytics. I, wouldn't, I don't want to discount it. I think it's going to be hugely important, but we have no idea yet what we're looking for. But if you don't have an idea what you're looking for, at least you need to start collecting, because if you don't collect, you'll never be able to see later when you realize what you can be looking for. And, and actually, I, I would encourage you all to look at, um, the, I don't know how you managed to run a conference and write blog posts, David, but there's a new blog post with a beautiful visualization kind of, of activity in, in, in a, a kind of a good example of learning analytics. And, and so I think we're at the beginning. I, you know, don't react too strongly to it. No one's trying to like, you know, turn learning into numbers. But I think there's going to be a lot of useful stuff in here, and we need to start collecting it and analyzing it. Then open has to <laughs> That's also in the wrong place. Um, so. <laughs> So, so the, the other thing is, th the things we can do now at a, at a much better scale is we can showcase our work and we can share it with others. And the, you know, at the core of open is that you share your work with others. And so there's this talk about portfolios, but it's much easier to do that online. Um, and you can bake it into the learning experience. So in, in one of those challenges in the Webcraft uh, uh, course, you have to write a blog post and you have to share it with others. And the whole idea is that as a web developer, what you need to do is, um, is develop a portfolio, right? Like if, as a web developer, the, your ability to show the world what you can do and get a job and, and have a reputation is through your portfolio. And so our course, Web Making 101, is basically the first step towards building a portfolio. At the end of that course, you'll have a very simple portfolio. And so we're baking these things into the learning, but they are at the same time assessments because they give people access to your portfolio. And then the last thing is, uh, listen to the community, right? So if you have, you make learning social and people interact with each other, those are the people that are able to give you very sophisticated feedback on, on, on your abilities. And so if you, if you look at things like Stack Exchange um, or Stack Overflow, uh, if you haven't, I think it's one of the most interesting assessment experiments we have online at the moment. It's a huge question and answer community and they do per very, very sophisticated analysis of the interaction between people and the voting up and down of other people's questions, of other people's answers, and of your own answers influence your score in that community. And they break it down in very nice ways where they say, kind of in, in the different application, what's your score, what are your top answers, so I can quickly review what your answers are. And they're selling this to employers now as, an, as a recruiting tool. And employers are willing to pay a lot of money to get access to these statistics. Um, and then also, you know, you can bake peer assessment into the everyday interactions in the community and you can aggregate that data. So if you're discussing with someone and they make a really good point, well, you can give them a star or a plus one. But you could also take a step further and you can give them a badge and you can say, you know, here's the helpful feedback badge. And that badge, maybe you only get it once three people have said it, but that badge stays with you. You can 
keep that in your portfolio, you can show it to other people, and you know, maybe the helpful feedback badge isn't the most important one, but you can, you can see where this is going uh, towards kind of more meaningful badges. So online, these things get easier. We have more data, more convenient sharing. We have many more peers, so we should uh, take advantage of this. And this is an area we're working on. Uh, we're spending a lot of time working on right now, uh, designing a, uh, a set of design guidelines and a framework for assessment of social learning online. And so if you're interested in this work or you're working in this space, I'd love to talk to you more. Uh, we're gonna release the first draft kind of for, for input in, in about two weeks. And so we, I'd love to find more people who, who wanna work on this. And now, uh, last thing, uh, the credentials, right? So um, I'm gonna skip through the first few very quickly, but just to say that the higher education accreditation system in the US is a major problem and prevents innovation in the open education space. And the, comp the only comparison I wanna make is between taxis in San Francisco and taxis in New York, right? So you go to San Francisco, you try to get a taxi, good luck. You go to New York, there's a taxi anywhere, any time of night, they know where, they, like you tell them where you wanna go, they know how to get there, it's awesome. Why is it so different? It's because you need a little um, vignette to have a taxi and there's an organization that controls how many vignettes there are for taxis. And in New York, they've taken one direction. In San Francisco, they've taken another direction. Higher education accreditation has taken the San Francisco direction for good reasons, I'm not discounting this, the reasons for this are quality. You wanna make sure that there's high quality. The problem is now that that's starting to backfire because first of all, we have people who buy accreditation so we end up with bad quality. And second of all, it's too difficult and forces you into a certain model that like people like P2P University could never be an accredited university. We have no intention of being one. But it's kind of sad that we couldn't ever be one. Like if we produce amazing, let's say we, produced amazing learning experience in the future and we tracked all of your learning and we would have all the data to back it up and you would have portfolios and badges and it would all be transparent and we'd know who you are. Well, why couldn't we be a university? Well, it's impossible. Anyway, so credentials are signals. Some signals are more explicit than others. We know what they mean by just looking at them. Other signals we have to learn to interpret, right? They don't say what they are. And degrees are signals that we have to learn to interpret. There's a lot of data that's not part of the degree. Now, we know that if my dog went to Harvard, uh, there's a good chance that she will be a successful private equity uh, lawyer <laughs> um, and, and ruin the world economy. <clears throat> um, anyway, so, you know, we, we, we place, I think that the, the interesting thing here is we place a lot of faith in these signals and that's based on the reputation that they've developed over, over time. And so these signals that we have today, they have two problems. One is there's a reputation versus innovation uh, um, choice, right? If you want reputation in the signals today, you need long history, you need kind of lots, of lo lots and lots of people coming through, moving on to do amazing work. You need, in universities, Buildings actually are helpful for your reputation. If you don't have buildings, it's difficult, more difficult to have a reputation. And then on the other side, you have innovation where, you know, the, 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 the amazing thing about open and the web is that things are moving very, very quickly. We don't have time to spend, you know, 250 years to build up a reputation before you believe that we do good work. Like, we, you know, 25 days is probably more, more real, realistic or reasonable. So. You know, th th there's a problem with the signals we have today that the, if we want our signals to have meaning, we need to find a way to deal with this re reputation problem. The other one is convenience versus authenticity. So signals are proxies, right? And that's convenient because if you give me a degree, I can place a lot of trust in it. I don't need to interview the people. I don't need to, I can, I mean, the reality is like you, you, you apply for a job, he's from Princeton, I'll invite him for the interview. He's from some other university, ah, you know, I'm not gonna invite him. But is that really, like, does that degree really tell you enough to make those decisions, you know, in many cases? I would argue not, but there's a convenience factor. You, you get a thousand applications, you need to filter out 950 of them. This is a really easy way of doing it, and maybe you're mostly right, and, you know, you'll hit and miss a little bit, but what do you care? But it's a problem because it, it prevents these other people to demonstrate how amazing they are and that they would be much better, and it, it's an inefficient system, essentially. On the other hand, authenticity, we can't all go out and sit next to the person we wanna hire and spend days and watch them talk to their colleagues and w how they're working and are they nice, you know, do they show up for, uh, on time? It's like, we don't have, we can't do that. It, it, 
it's, it's simply too much work. So we have this drawback. The signals need to help us. They need to be convenient, but they need to retain as much authenticity as possible. And so I guess you know it might be worth uh, trying out new signals. And there's this big discussion now about the open badges infrastructure. And I will run through this very quickly, but the, there's a person here sitting right there, Carla Casilli, who's waving her hand. Stand, please stand up for a moment. So, sorry. So Carla is uh, working at Mozilla and is the project manager of the Open Badges Infrastructure Project at the moment, together with another lady that's on maternity leave, Erin Knight, who deserves a lot of credit for all this, this work. And it's something that we kind of started figuring out together, five, two. Um, anyone can issue badges. Um, <laughs> So what's interesting about badges? Anyone can issue badges, right? The reputation of the issue is still important, but there are no more barriers to entry. Like there's no approval process. So what we've already seen in the open education space is that people were hacking that, right? So David Wiley issued Wiley certificates for people who took his open education course. It's a hack, but he's a professor at a university, so you know, it, it, he's still, it's still part of the system. Joey Ito gave certificates for people who took a digital journalism course at P2PU. Now, Joey doesn't have a university degree, and he wasn't the director of the Media Lab when he did this, but he's still a very well-known guy in the media space, so like his personal reputation carried. But there's also people like this guy, John Britton. John Britton hacked the certification system by saying to people, if you take my course at P2PU, I'll write you a recommendation on LinkedIn. And people did it. People asked for the recommendation on LinkedIn, and they listed the P2P experience in their education profile. So people hack this. But why do they have to hack it if we can give them an infrastructure where they don't have to go through all these lengths and work in LinkedIn? We, let, we give you the infrastructure that you can do this much more easily. And so it's anyone can issue, but you can also imagine people issuing badges for any skill, for any competency, for any accomplishment that you think is important. And I guess one thing I want to say about badges, I think we, we, to we chose the wrong term. I think there's a lot of pushback and, and negative response to the term badges because it makes people feel like we're trying to gamify everything. And we are not. A Harvard degree is a, is a, is a signal. A badge is a signal. A Harvard degree is a badge, right? So don't, I guess I'm inviting you to not respond immediately to the term badge, but to look at the other two terms, open it infrastructure, which I think are much more important uh, in this conversation. And so uh, any skill competency, including the ones people care about, we've actually gone out to web developers and asked them what are the skills that are most important for you. And surprisingly, it's not the hard skills like JavaScript, PHP, open source, it's the soft skills. Web developers, if you ask them to write recommendations for each other, the things they put in those recommendations are things like he can translate the ideas of the client into code. He can explain things to his co her co she can explain things to her coworkers. She helped me with when I got stuck with my problems. She was, you know, uh, very organized and kept the team on time. Like those are the things that they care about and those things don't ever show up in any kind of computer science degree. So badges can act as motivators, they can act as guides. Um, I talked about this a little bit before, so at the end of the challenge, you can see where you're going next. They're transparent, so each badge has a link to the evidence that's underlying the badge, which means we will see lots of experimentation, but we can all see what the experimentation is. It's not like we have to, you know, we see something that's closed and then we, we figure out what it means with, like, with degrees, and then we have some trust in it later. But we can actually look at the badge, we can click on the badge, takes me to a website where they got the badge, where the evidence is stored, I can look through the evidence, I can have a description of, for example, the P2PU badges, many of them are peer awarded, there'll be a description of the logic, needs three votes from their peers, needs a vote from someone who's already completed the badge. You know, you can review all of this, and then you can engage with it. And so there will be, hopefully, there will be a huge amount of experimentation in both assessment and credentialing as a result of having this open infrastructure. And there's a, there's a competition, if you haven't looked at it, digital media and learning competition, focused on badges. If you have ideas for badges, I look at that and, and see if you can, uh, you, you want to come and, and experiment uh, in some of these ways. And then finally, there's ways of sharing your achievements that, that are different. You can move these badges around the web. You can put them on your Google Plus profile. I made this up, of course. You can't do that today. But uh, this is what kind of what it will work like in the future. And you can move them around freely, and you, you will actually get them as an image file that you can put on a USB drive even and give to another person. So you really are in control of your own achievements. You don't have to ask someone to kind of certify. The badge itself contains all the information you need. So um, I try to imagine a little bit what the impossible future of open education 
uh, looks like. And, and as I said before, I'm not so good at imagining. I'm much better at building. And I, I would invite everyone to join us and, and build this future of open education because it's, it's an incredibly exciting time. The opportunities that we have today to do things, we haven't had them even 10 years ago. Some of these ideas that we have today didn't exist. People had, the, the scale we can have, the impact we can have, the connections we can make between people, it's really, I think, the most exciting time to be working in, in this space. And so I, uh, I, am, I, I wake up every morning and I, I, can't, I don't want to do anything else, and I'm sure all of you do. And so it's great to be in a community at Open Ed where it feels like the people are building this future together. And so that's the end of my 98th slide. Thank you. <laughs>